the old model for success. Historically, musicians have needed at least these three things in order to have a chance at the quote-unquote successful release. Access to financing for recording and manufacturing your record. Access to the promotion channels. Um, commercial radio is particularly good at actually helping sell, sell records, at least in the old model of success. Um, and then access to distribution, which meant the, the ways that you could get your music into retail stores and in front of potential consumers. There was really only one way you could do that prior to sort of the development of the internet uh, models, which was m assigning a major label contract. And, the, um, and th this would give you access to the label's PR and distribution machinery. Uh, but the trade-off was that almost always you had to sign away your copyrights. Of course, there were always a lot of independent artists that worked on outside of the system, and there's actually a very functional independent music community. But, um, you know, you had limited resources, and you were sort of stuck at a certain level of um, access because you couldn't get play on commercial radio or anything without um, get having a major label relationship. But technology has changed a lot of stuff. Better com consumer technologies, uh, GarageBand, and... Uh, Logics and all these all these uh, software packages make it possible for artists to pay less to actually have uh, do some recording. Uh, it's still really hard to get on commercial radio, but now there's thousands of other ways you can access promotional channels. Many of them free: internet, satellite radio, social networks, blogs, YouTube. Most of them you can almost access without paying anything. Then there's universal access to distribution. There's a very low barrier to entry. It's almost, you know, between 30 and 100 bucks you can have your stuff distributed to all of the major online uh, digital music stores and subscription services, not only in the United States, but the, ma the major ones around the world. And, that, you know, it's important to say that I think the changes in the past 10 to 12 years have really completely changed the playing field for musicians and really opened up a lot of new opportunities for people. So. But we're just going to run through buckets of new ways for people to access music and correspondingly how artists are compensated through all these different models. Digital stores, on-demand playback services, subscription services, um, some new artists with fan connections, some new patronage models, which I think are particularly interesting for this community, and also some webcasting and satellite radio. Um, just a couple of little points. We have some handouts on that back table that really chart out and itemize the compensation components for each of these different, um, you know, rev the, these different models. And it talks about what, how much the songwriter gets paid, the label, the performer. And um, so we have that spreadsheet on the back. It's also available at that URL. There's also a worksheet back there about how you actually get your music from, you know, from your home studio into all of these music services using one of the digital aggregators, such as TuneCore, or CD Baby, or Reverb Nation, and um, the way that your, art, your music gets to, into the services and how, much, how, the money, how the money comes back to you, and how much it costs to actually use those services. Uh, you know, I have two caveats, actually. One of them is, absolutely. Do you have one now? Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yes, I will. So her question is, is there a better success rate in actually using these services to get the money back to you? And I would say yes. Um, we use, uh, I ran a record label in the 90s, and um, the, our, not only was my band on the label, we represented a bunch of other bands. And we use IOTA to um, have our stuff available on iTunes and Rhapsody and everything. And it's very transparent. I know exactly when it's coming. It comes every month. Um, with CD Baby, the money comes every Monday if you're selling stuff. And everything has gotten, I think, much more transparent. And Ethan, I would ask you if you think the same thing, too. If things have seemed more transparent and more reliable. Because the old way version of distributing stuff meant you um, waited 90 days and you possibly got paid. And uh, you hoped you got paid. And then, if not, you had to make a lot of phone calls to get paid and things like that. So. Um, so just to be clear, this is, um, this, the rest of these slides are mostly about, um, there's lots of great ways you can promote music on the internet now, but this is all about um, services and models that have some compensation component to it. 
So you'll see some stuff like, why isn't she talking about Facebook? It's like, that's just about promotion, and we can talk about that in other panels today. Um, and the second thing is that um, we should put this in perspective. It's um, unlikely that any of these new services will take the place of the revenue that's generated from traditional CD sales or money from playing shows. But they do offer musicians and music fans a huge range of options, some of them that even feel free to the consumer but are actually compensating artists. So digital stores, there's two kinds. There's the kind where a consumer or just ordered the CD and it's like mail order, right? And then there's the second kind where a consumer goes and they can download uh, a digital file or an album. Just to make it easy, I just picked one artist, Aaron McCown, to just follow through for different models. So CD Baby, how many of you have used or members of CD Baby? Oh yeah, awesome. So we probably all know the things that CD Baby offers to artists. The three big ones are they act as your mail order house, and you set the price, and then CD Baby will take care of all of the mailing to your customers. And uh, whatever the price you set is, they keep $4, and you get the rest. The other thing they do is they act as the digital aggregator. So if Erin wants her stuff in iTunes and she wants CD Baby to be the liaison, um, CD Baby will encode and deliver the music to all of the major music stores. And for this sales and streams off of those um, third-party websites, um, uh, the artist gets 91% of the net profits off those. They also um, allow people to, uh, musicians to do MP3 downloads straight off your CD Baby page. I guess Aaron is not doing that for this one, but um, you get 75% of those gross sales if you're using CD Baby. Um, you probably all know the really interesting statistics about CD Baby. Many artists use it, over 275,000 um, albums have been sold and over 100 million paid directly to artists. And you know, given the limited options that musicians had even 10 years ago, it's easy to see how CD Baby's model, like embracing simplicity and transparency, um, has really been important for the music community and I think replicated in other models as, we've, as things have developed. We sort of keep ref referencing that Simplicity and transparency are important parts of this developing um, business model. So here's the same album on iTunes. I don't know how she got it there, but if she was using CD Baby, she'd get 91% of, of any sale. If she's using TuneCore, she'd get 100% of the net profits from the sale of a single download or an album. Same record on Amazon. Um, Amazon, you know, sometimes the prices are a little bit different, but they again offer downloads as MP3s, which is good because then it can be played on any players or computers. And you can get it, uh, the single MP3s of the whole album. And again, artists get between 91 and 100% of the um, net profits from, that are paid to the aggregator. Yeah. on Amazon, I think so, yeah. yeah. Um, so the, I just wanted to show you an interesting widget. There's um, a band in Chicago called The Layaways, and over there in the corner, they have an Amazon MP3, um, what do they call those things? Like a, a widget embedded to drive traffic to their songs on Amazon, and they signed up for Amazon's referral program, so they get a small fee for any click-throughs that come from their website to Amazon. And um, David Harrell from the band said that that money comes to them directly from Amazon. It doesn't go through the aggregator. And it may not be much, but it's nice to know that there's a little widget you can put on your website to push people to your songs on Amazon that actually has a little compensation part to it. So we'll move on to subscription services. There's, um, in the US, there's a handful. The three ones that people um, are most familiar with are Rhapsody and Napster and Mog. And the consumer pays from five to twelve dollars a month for access to these enormous catalogs of music, sometimes millions of songs. And as part of your monthly fee, you get to access everything. So here's Aaron's album on Rhapsody. And there's a number of things as a consumer I could go and do. I could listen to the whole album, or I could listen to particular songs, or I could put together a playlist of things that include her music, or I could um, listen to Aaron McCowan radio, or I could download and purchase an MP3. 
And the other thing Rhapsody has done, um, they have an, a little Ibiza player, which is kind of like their version of an iPod. And um, you can put, you can load it up so it's like Rhapsody on the go. And well, the interesting thing about it is that as you um, put your music on, it recognizes what, you're, got, what you got on your Ibiza. Then when you go and you're doing your lap, you're, you know, jogging on your treadmill, and you come back and you resynchronize the Ibiza player with your Rhapsody account, it recognizes what you played and counts those plays towards the music, the, the musicians, like sort of total count for the month, which is different than iPods because iPods just don't do that. Um, Rhapsody uh, has iPhone apps now, right? <laughs> so you can stream all your music on your Rhapsody account through your phone. There's the same record on eMusic, and eMusic is slightly different. It's not um, a music subscription service like I'm streaming everything I want. It's a subscription download service. So it's kind of like the buffet version. I'll pay $13 a month and I'll get 40 songs or something. So the, uh, the, the consumer is purchasing MP3s in bulk quantity sometimes for people who are really interested in having a fairly large music collection. So um, for the artists, yeah. Yeah, so there are four different, different um, entities that get paid money when things happen on Rhapsody. And it depends on what type of, of um, experience, what, what's going on. Like if I'm, streaming, if I'm streaming a song, the publisher, the songwriter, and the publisher and the songwriter get paid for downloads, the songs, the sound recording, copyright owner, which is usually the label, and the performer get paid. It's very complicated, and it's a penny, basically a penny per stream when you're streaming. Um, the worksheets on the back really talk about it in the sort of detailed language, but yeah, it's pennies per stream. Yes. They get BMI and ASCAP, uh, Rhapsody, and the other music streaming services have licenses to stream those music, that music. So songwriters and performers are technically, yes, paid when their stuff is digitally streamed. Yes. Yeah. And sound exchange. And sound exchange. The performer comes through sound exchange. So the songwriter and the composer go through BMI, ask that feedback. Oh, that was just a, oops, just a little picture to show how eMusic has a bit of a social networking component. Some of the other services don't really uh, do that. So they're trying to say, if you like this, you like that, or have related artists or um, conversations going along based on people's recommendations or feedback on the records. Um, so artist to fans with variable pricing, I thought I would just talk a bit about this, which um, most people have heard about Radiohead's attempt or experiment about a year and a half ago, two and a half years ago. So um, you could download in rainbows off their website for any price you wish, um, including zero, although there was a 99 cent transaction fee on all the, uh, the transactions on their website. Um, so. People were sort of thrilled by this and curious about this experiment. It really worked for ra Radiohead. We don't know much about it. They didn't talk about how many downloads they had and not sure about that, uh, but it doesn't really matter because, you know, they had a successful sort of physical release using an American label and had a huge tour. So, you know, but this is Radiohead. This is a very interesting concept, but very hard to replicate because very few of us are Radiohead. <laughs> So here's a little twist on it, though, that sometimes the hints of what the important parts of this are. So Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails likes the Radiohead idea, and he put out Ghosts 1 through 4 in 2008. But instead of just saying, pay what you wish, he thought there should be more tiered pricing associated with this. So you could get um, the first nine songs for free or $5 for download, and there's different tiered prices all the way up to $300 for a deluxe, limited edition, super signed, awesome, great thing. And he sold all those. So <laughs> the, other, the other good thing about Trent Reznor's thing is he talked a lot about, about it. He was in the press and he wrote articles and blog posts. And he said he made $1.6 million in the first like 10 days or something, mostly just selling the high-end stuff and then all, this, um, all these other price points, which um, that wasn't it though. He also had it on Amazon for $5. And he seeded the peer-to-peer -peer networks with his own work. So it was available for free on LimeWire, too. 
And the interesting thing is um, that it was the best-selling album of 2008 on Amazon. So the important part, I think, about this is that he recognized that there's all sorts of different fans of his work. There's the crazy Uber fan that wants the $300 set, and there's the casual person that just might want to hear the first nine songs. And he made, he made it possible for everybody to interact with him on a very specific way. Um, now, again, that's Trent Reznor. He was in Nine Inch Nails on a major label through the 90s. And it's, again, not, not really easy to replicate the success level he has, but it does t it hints at what's important, you know. Quality, uh, being on many platforms at many places, like being able to be on many platforms simultaneously, and also recognizing the different price points can really appeal to different types of fans. So patronage models, an old-fashioned concept now easily facilitated by the internet. So how many of you heard of Art Artist Share? Yeah, really interesting. It's a um, basically an, a label, and they help they um, they help fans support their favorite artists through a patronage model that monetizes the creative process. So this is um, Maria Schneider, and um, this is just a picture of her most recent project, and she won her second Grammy front on Artist Share. This Last, 2009, I think. So here's just a picture of a page, you know, uses embedded video about her, talking about her next project, and then it describes the project, and then down the right-hand column, there's all these different price points for the ways that you can participate and support her upcoming work. You know, and some of it goes to, I just want to, you know, have access to a web chat once in a while, or I'd like to see what her scores look like when she's composing, all the way to, I'd like to have executive producer credit on the record. And there's, <laughs> there's a lot of different price points, and there, you know, Artist Share is a very interesting model. It's kind of um, based on the fact he used the, the Artist Share kind of just works with the people who already have existing careers and have huge fan bases already, so it makes more sense. But it's a very interesting model, and it works, I think, for some people that have enough of a creative process that it's really interesting to engage with them on it. Um, here's one artist who did her own patronage model, which is Jill Sabiel, the singer-songwriter. Um, in 2008, she appealed to her fan base to um, fund her next record. She expected she needed $75,000 to do it, and she had this list of, you know, incentives to, uh, and some of them are great, you know, like plutonium level, weapons for every time, you get to come and sing on my CD. Don't worry if you can't sing, we can fix that on our end. And, <laughs> And she'll do house concerts. She wrote, um, she wrote songs that had people's names inserted in them and all this stuff. And it worked. She raised $81,000 from her fan base this way. And, um, um, well, she hadn't been on a major label for a while. I mean, she was in the 80s. And maybe in the early 90s she was on a major label. But she's been somewhat of a solo singer-songwriter for a while, unless somebody else can correct me. I feel like she's been kind of on her own for a while. Yeah. She's very funny, um, and she, she did some really good press about this stuff, too. It was very interesting. And so, you know, it worked for her. Um, yes. She charged for the album, but people who had contributed, say, $10 in advance, like, I want to support you, they got it for free when it came out. Thanks. So uh, Kickstarter, this is a really interesting way to fund your work. Um, it basically, it's allowing filmmakers, musicians, designers, even kind of people who want to do a trip around the world on, this, on the sailboat, fund their work. Um, it's an all or nothing um, funding method. So projects must be fully funded uh, or, the, or no money changes hands. So if you need $20,000, and you start appealing to your musician base, but you only get 14000 the money gets refunded back to the patrons because if you can't meet your target by the certain deadline, then the money just reverts back to everybody. And, but you do get to keep 100% ownership of your work, and at this point, I think Kickstarter is still free to use, although your project has to be somewhat um, approved by Kickstarter in order for it to be part of their system. I'll just show you a little project page. This is a band from Oakland. Do people know this? Not a band. It's a pro uh, yeah. 
it's a sound project, I guess I should say. So they're trying to get they're trying to get eighty yeah, eight eight thousand two hundred twenty four dollars to build this thing and they're they've got forty six days to go and you can see all these different pledge amounts. Dollar, five dollars, twenty dollars, it keeps going down, you know, so you can fund their work. Then there's um, Pledge Music, a similar project that's mostly musician focused. Um, again, you keep your rights. Um, you get you encourage people to fund your work through incentives and different uh, price points and pr different levels. There's a charity component to this as well, um, so that they're trying to encourage uh, the charity efforts to advance. And um, and uh, Benji Rogers, who's the founder of Pledge Music, will be here later today, so we can ask him some particular questions about it. Yes. Yeah, my question was about uh, all people who pledge. Do yes. you get any of their contact information, email addresses, or do you know who's giving yes, the money to? Yes, you do. Um, you can do anonymous pledges. You can do anonymous pledges, um, but I know that as you fill it out, it, it does it does ask you to, to put in all your information as a donor. Yeah. Is there a component for trying to get people to back your, to promote the, that you've got your service on a pledge music or something like that so you can get people to yes. pledge? Yes, they have all these sort of cool social networky widget things to help you um, spread the word that you're using Pledge Music or you're using Kickstarter to fund your work. Yeah, they have some really cool stuff. Whole um, marketing plan that they that they give you, like a how to do that when you sign up for this. Thing. Yeah. There's a couple others like Celeband and um, Slice the Pie. The slightly different um, takes on a similar model, like this one. Uh, sell a band. You, each chunk is ten dollars contribution, and each band has to, you know, get five thousand people to give ten dollars in order for the project to be funded enough for it to go ahead. But this one has a slightly it's slightly older than P Kickstarter and Pledge Music, and there's a bit of a sort of like we're the record label, we get to keep some of your copyrights at least for a little bit of time. So just if you're interested in it, just make sure you read all the details. Um, so licensing, we're going to have a whole conversation about licensing later today. Um, this is, um, I just wanted to show you a couple of sort of models that are trying to facilitate the licensing process, but we can talk about the pros and cons of this t version of licensing when we have a conversation later today. So um, this is kind of licensing, like putting your, your music gets licensed for an ad or a TV show or um, hold music at your dentist's office, whatever it is. Um, it's an interesting revenue stream because um, for musicians and songwriters, um, because not only is there a lot of m there are opportunities to license music because there's so many things that need music now. Um, there's lots of creative projects and extra TV shows and cable channels. But usually, you negotiate uh, a specific fee for the use, but you don't give away any copyrights when it gets licensed. So it's just an ex exclusive or maybe even non-exclusive short-term licensing agreement. But I'll let the lawyers fill me in later on this stuff. Um, this is Rumblefish, which is a B2B music licensing service. Um, if you're using it, um, so here's a licensing form for just a band called True Love Always. And you can see if you go through and you can click off all the different criteria for the license that you want to get. Oh, I want it to be a year, and I'm going to, this is actually for hold music. Um, the number of systems you have, how telephone on hold music. I want the whole song and all these things. And um, when you hit get the price, it generates a price so that um, the person who wants to love always on their whole music can figure out what the price is and actually just sign a licensing agreement right there. And to love always would get 50% of the license fee and Rumblefish gets the other 50%. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're just, it's because we're webcasting, we have to keep talking in the mic. Do, the, do you sign up your music with them, or do they audition it and decide they want to include it in their catalog, or how does that work? Um, you can submit your music. They don't, um, as far as I know, there's no editorial. They, they just accept music, and when you put your music in, you categorize it by different sort of criteria and qualities to it, like, oh, this is, uh, you know, this would go good with, you know, uh, singer songwriter or heavy guitars and stuff like that so that when people are looking for music for a particular use, like I need heavy guitars for a car, you know, for a car chase, that, that they can kind of browse through the available catalog and find stuff they like. 
Um, here's the, oh yes, sorry. <clears throat> My question about um, licensing music for use in other things like in film, TV, on hold, whatever that is. What if you're just a, a cover singer and you have a particular arrangement of a song, you're li you have it licensed because it's on your CD and you've licensed the CD. Can you submit your version of a song or does it have to only be the songwriter who does that? I'm going to actually defer to Michael Ashburn, who's in the back row there. It, here, can you give the microphone to him? Well, we'll probably talk about this later on the licensing panel, but essentially, uh, if you control the master, then you can license the master, but without the musical composition, that license isn't going to be uh, acceptable because both are going to be used by the, uh, the licensee. So you have to make sure that the publishing uh, copyright, that the person who controls the publishing is contacted. So like my albums are 100% cop um, licensed through Harry Fox Agency. So does that mean I can submit one of the tunes that I've recorded for these other opportunities? I don't think I understand. I'm not the songwriter. So these are, so that, so you can only get your music through these venues if you're a songwriter. Let's wait, let's wait until this afternoon, we'll go into it more. Yeah, it's true. This is a, definitely a complicated issue and that's um, kind of why we're doing a panel about licensing just because it is very particular and we're, you know, we'll have some people like Brooke Wentz from Rights which Workshop and Michael to really talk about the, the details. So, yeah. Yes? A question on Rumblefish and probably this one is when they, they pay the artist, is it through BMI or ASCAP? Well, what they would uh, pay you for is if you've got a direct licensing deal, like, oh, hey, say, um, you know, Jaguar decides they want to use your song, then they pay you 50% based on whatever the licensing deal is. But sometimes there's um, performance royalties that are based on the use. You know, ASCAP, BMRC, ZAC would pay you with it's like, say, you're using a movie or whatever. Um, again, this is another thing we'll talk about on the licensing panel, because it is sort of particular. Licensing is very, but, but yes, if it's a public performance, there is a performance royalty for that, too. Um, just the last, yeah. Mm. And this probably will be addressed in the breakout mm -hmm. sessions, but. Um, I was just thinking, you know, I have music on all these different things, but h how do you, it's sort of like once you get them out there, it's sort of like all the other stuff. It, it, it's hard to get anyone to pay attention if you're not famous. Yeah. So yeah. I guess the question is, it's cool to do all this stuff, but then what I, I have found, and maybe it's just because I don't know a lot about promoting, that it's like sitting out on CD Baby and people get it like in the first week I have it out and then no one looks at it ever yeah. again. So it's like, how do you keep that? Yeah. How do you keep that stuff fresh and how do you get it to the attention of like, um, you know, TV shows and stuff? Because mostly they're taking people who you already have heard of, not, it seems like, I don't know. Yeah, so. um, I don't know. I, again, it seems like you're right. We'll probably talk a bit about licensing, but also the social networking breakout today, we'll talk about the things you can do to try to um, encourage people to sort of keep the, keep, keep the attention on your work. And I'm not saying it's easy or... You're not time consuming, it probably is. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, these, all these things have pros and cons to them. Um, and also, we'll talk to Erica a bit about how you do it also. Um, so, uh, just the last little bit is the webcasting and satellite radio. Um, so, I just picked KEXP in Seattle as uh, just a model. You know, it's a terrestrial station in Seattle. But they um, webcast, and they have been for a long time. They have um, sort of live updated playlists, so you know what's being played as of right now. There's buy buttons next to their um, every song, and so it connects you to iTunes or Amazon or local radio or local record shops. And um, there's performance royalties. Um, ASCAP, BMI, CSEC pay the songwriter, and Sound Exchange pays the performer and the sound recording copyright owner for the digital stream. Um, Brian Calhoun from Sound Exchange is going to be here today to talk on the last panel, so we can talk a lot more about webcasting royalties and what Sound Exchange does to pay performers and sound recording copyright owners. Many of you are probably, own, if you own your own masters, you're also your own sound recording copyright owner.
um, Counterstream Radio, American Music um, Center's uh, online webcast, which is, doesn't have a terrestrial radio station component. It's just online, but it's streaming music. And so they pay ASCAP EMI CSAC, and they pay Sound Exchange. So the performer the, and the co composer are compensated when people listen to their music. Um, Pandora. Yay, Pandora. Um, <laughs> regional favorites. And, um, you know, they're, it's a site that facilitates personalized music discovery. And if so, if you pop in the name of a band and it starts to build um, a radio station around the ap attributes of that song, not about the band or the label they're on, but the attributes of the song. Um, for music fans, it feels free or you can pay $36 a year and have no ads around it. Um, it's a great way to discover new music. And again, songwriters and performers and labels are each paid simultaneously and directly through the performance rights organizations and sound exchange. Um, there's an interesting, uh, by the way, they have an iPhone app and th this has been like, I think what really pushed them up over the edge because they, um, I think they have 50 million subscribers now <laughs> and 50 million users. And we'll have to ask Brian Calhoun this because um, they have just did a Facebook integration um, about two weeks ago. So you can see what your friends are listening to in their Pandora stream. And um, yeah, and Roku. So, um, so it's, um, we'll ask Brian Calhoun, but I think Pandora makes up a very large percentage of the sound exchange royalties that come in now, so. And there, here's Last FM, another social network meets webcasting streaming service. Um, it's pretty cool, although their they're, um, terms of payment and what they're doing, and I think they turned off streaming about two weeks ago, so everything's changing at Last FM, but it is, has been very popular with people um, about sort of integrating social networking and music discovery together. There's a handout at the back that really explains how you get your music into these services. But if you're, it's important to recognize that iTunes and Rhapsody, they don't deal directly with artists. They just don't have the capacity. That'd be way too many people to deal with. So they rely on digital aggregators for music to be delivered to them. And so the core aggregators are for unsigned artists, CD Baby, TuneCore, Reverb Nation, Nimbit, Amazon's CreateSpace. Um, those are the big ones, right? Yep. IOTA works for labels. So IOTA, and The Orchard mostly deal with labels that have catalogs of music, like not just one release, but many releases. So, so that is a uh, blast through <laughs> some new music, uh, new business models. And I wanted to just turn the um, podium over to Ethan Diamond from Bandcamp to talk a bit about the way that Bandcamp is helping musicians, like giving them a giant toolbox to be, be able to actually install, say, build, I'm not even gonna say it. Make sure that you can monetize your own website, basically, right? Cut out all the middlemen. So here you go, Ethan. Hey, everybody. Uh, sure. Okay, so <coughs> what we do, um, are you guys, how many people are already familiar with Bandcamp or have a little bit of, okay, it's like a little, maybe a third. Okay, so what we do is um, we provide an e-commerce platform that helps artists uh, sell their music and their merchandise directly to their fans on their own Bandcamp-powered uh, website. Um, as Kristen said, cutting out a lot of uh, the middlemen in the process. So what you do is you upload uh, your music and it becomes available for sale immediately. It's not, uh, not the case that you send your stuff to a digital distributor and then you wait a month and <coughs> it hopefully shows up on Bandcamp. You, you upload it yourself and then uh, it's available for sale uh, whenever, t as soon as it's done. And then when a fan buys your music, the money uh, goes directly to you uh, immediately again. Uh, and you're not waiting until the end of the month or uh, four to six weeks after the end of the month to get a check. So our goal, I would say in short, is, our, is we're a technology platform and, and the we have one goal, and that's uh, to be the best in the world at making artists money. So, uh, it's something quit, quit unexpectedly. I'm going to I'm going to give you a quick demo of Bandcamp, and we'll do that as soon. Yeah, no problem. Okay. <laughs> 
great. Okay, so <clears throat> what you're looking at here is a, a Bandcamp-powered website for an artist named Sophie Madeline. And you can see that it's, um, it's a super clean, simple design. Uh, this, she's got her discography running along the right-hand side, um, big cover art, uh, a custom header of her own design. And then, of course, you can stream the music, and it starts up right away. And then if we scroll down a little bit, there's uh, all of the uh, lyrics and, and liner notes and so on right here. Um, so one thing about this is that it's all structured in a way to be uh, search engine friendly. So um, if you click on, for example, uh, one of the songs here, you can see the, um, the URL is structured in a way that it's uh, friendly to search engines. And the result of this kind of structuring, uh, where the website is more like a blog rather than being a typical Flash-based uh, um, uh, artist site that ends up being kind of a black box to Google, uh, the result is that we get most of our traffic um, from searches. Uh, fans looking for your lyrics, uh, your, um, your track names, your album names, and so on. We get more traffic from that, actually, than we even get from, from Facebook, for example. Um, so then when uh, somebody wants to download your music, uh, let's see, they just uh, will click on download album here. So the first thing you notice is that we give uh, the fans uh, their choice of what format they want. And the default is a 320K MP3, but um, we also offer a bunch of high quality formats like uh, FLAC, uh, Apple Lossless, Aug Vorbis and stuff. And most fans just want an MP3. But there's this rabid minority of people out there that want the best quality they can possibly get, and they're often willing to pay a premium for that. And <coughs> our feeling is that's great. Um, we want to support that, but it's also crazy to expect artists to necessarily know what Ogborbis is, uh, much less create it and maintain it as a format. So, um, so what you do as an artist is you upload uh, a single lossless audio file to us. So you upload, you don't upload MP3s. You upload an AIF, AIFF file or a WAV file or um, or even a FLAC file, and um, we take care of all that transcoding for you. Okay, so then um, the next thing we offer is total pricing flexibility. So instead of having a store tell you uh, what uh, your pricing uh, is going to be, you can make your music completely free. You can make it free but require an email address. You can offer it for a set price of whatever you want, or you can let fans name their price. And when um, you let fans name their price, the twist is that you can actually set the floor to whatever it is that you want. So um, unlike you know, radi the Radiohead name your price where uh, you know, it can be zero and a lot of people pay zero, if you want, you can just set a floor and say, my music, is this album is worth at least $5. That's the minimum you can pay. But if you want to pay me more, great, do that. And that's what um, is happening here. Uh, so you can just put in you know, whatever you want as the price. Uh, but you have to uh, charge at least, or she's charging at least $5. So the result of that um, it turns out to be really interesting. Uh, across the entire system, fans are paying on average 50% more than whatever the artist sets as the floor. And I think that um, the lesson is that when you make it clear that this is a place where uh, artists, uh, sorry, fans can support the artists that they love directly um, and uh, not necessarily Steve Jobs, um, then you know, they're happy to do that. And they, uh, they give you a little bit more money. So um, the other thing that we offer is uh, the ability to sell physical merchandise side by side with digital. Uh, so you can um, offer things like a limited edition vinyl uh, record or a silkscreen digipack CD. And then when somebody buys that, uh, they, they get the digital download immediately. And then uh, they're sent, um, you're sent their uh, shipping information, and then they get the physical package afterwards. Yep, go ahead, sorry. Thank you. Uh, could you have a drive CD Baby distribution? I have it send an email to CD, CD Baby or no? Okay. So we we do. Do you want to actually? Erica uses it. <laughs> so. They do offer links to external CD stores. So if you don't want to sell your CD through Bandcamp, or even if you do, you can add a link to CD Baby. So they can stream it on CD Baby, buy it, or stream it on Bandcamp, buy it at CD Baby. 
But in terms of the fulfillment of uh, physical um, goods, we provide an interface um, where you can give a fulfillment partner uh, an account that only has access to your orders and where they can set things set things as shipped or not shipped and get all of those details. And I can show you that uh, a little later in the demo. Can you use it to sell uh, videos? For example, if you have a live performance video, um, can, like a DVD. But I know you can do it probably for a physical DVD, but can you do it for like downloadable? Uh, right, videos? so with every album that uh, you upload, you can assign arbitrary um, digital goods into it so, you can, so that they come down as part of the zip file. So we have artists on the system, for example, selling um, tracks where they've um, included uh, a live video of that track as part of the download, and you can you can do that uh, with anything. People do it with uh, PDF liner notes, uh, booklets like uh, um, sheet music, uh, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, sure. So um, one of the things uh, that kind of drives me crazy about um, buying physical goods online is that you're often ex you know like the uh, the three hundred dollar box set uh, that we saw earlier. It's hard to get excited about buying um, those things when you're looking at a 75 pixel, square pixel uh, image of the product that you're um, going to spend all this money on. So we made it really easy for artists to upload high quality art and then um, made it easy for fans to actually you know, click on that and see what they're getting. So in the, this case, she's selling this record and uh, a print that she made. And then we also um, handle inventory tracking and when it gets low, we put up a little warning like this. And uh, then when somebody chooses to buy it, um, we also uh, obviously allow you to specify all the shipping options. And then one thing that we handle in the background that I think is often, has in the past been a real pain for artists is we handle the correct, um, collecting the correct taxes. So uh, I think the alternative in the past has been um, to go into PayPal, for example, and set up a bunch of different tax profiles. But then, you know, taxes change, and there are literally, you know, in California, hundreds of different uh, tax rates. So we integrate with a service that basically captures all of that dynamically. So we look at where the fan is buying from and where you're selling from. And if taxes apply, we charge the right taxes, you collect the right taxes, and uh, it's no longer a problem. So then when somebody checks out, uh, their download starts up right away, and then you get an email with um, the details of where to ship to. So um, to your question earlier, uh, you can ship those out yourself, or we provide um, an interface uh, to integrate with a, um, with a fulfillment partner. Question so, in the back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when you uh, sign up for this band camp, is does it so this is like your website now or, or is this just anything like if you were to have like a myspace page in addition to your website or is this like becomes your website our goal is uh to be your website or at, at least a section the music section of your website so we provide a couple of things to help with that um first of all you'll see that you know there's no branding on the page if you scroll all the way down we have a little bandcamp footer <laughs> along the bottom here but um, the fact that we're in the URL in this example um, is just because she hasn't customized the URL. You can do that for free, so you can make it music.yourbandname.com um, or store.yourbandname.com. And then the header up here, you can customize that, and um, you can have it match the header for your own website. So if you've got a website on WordPress or anything like that, this is easy to integrate as the, uh, as the music section. Right, right. We decided, yeah, and it's not that we want, don't ever want to do bio, photos, sh like show listings and so on, but we decided we're going to start with um, music first because it's arguably the most important part and um, technically it was kind of the most challenging, so we decided to focus on first. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I have Erica Mulkey sitting here. She's a, a solo artist that does Unwoman. And the reason I did uh, invite her to be here today is because you're, um, you're using Bandcamp as you know, your music uh, sort of sales point, I guess. But when I looked on her website, I realized she was everywhere. You were on CD Baby and eMusic, and you were tweeting, and you had a Facebook, Facebook friend. And so I thought I would ask you um, two things. First, how do you get your music into all the digital music stores? Who is your digital aggregator? 
And then second, you know, how, do you, how does Bandcamp integrate into what you do now? And third, talk about your social networking strategy a little bit. I know we have a whole session about it later, but I want to see how you see it um, affecting your sales. Um, so I, I had a day job up until a few months ago, and uh, for eight years I was doing this solo project. I play cello and sing. Um, I play in other people's bands, and I have CDs that I produce myself. And I was on CD Baby, and um, they did a really great job of taking care of everything for me once I had a CD. Um, you know, they would sell things, they would put it into iTunes. Um, for my latest release, which I quit my job to spend an entire month doing nothing but working on. Um, I felt really proud of it. I knew it was going to be really successful. Um, I chose Reverb Nation to put it into iTunes so that I would get 100% of the sales. So we'll see if that ends up um, being a good choice. But, you know, um, and they, they got everything into iTunes on time. So that was pretty awesome. And I chose the, um, like, there's like a, I think a $35 Reverb Nation option and a $55 one or something in those ranges. And I chose the more expensive one because it would get things into Pandora and, you know, further out all the other places that, um, uh, yeah, so that's, so I let the aggregators do it for me. It's pretty easy. Um, and then uh, social media wise, um, I, I, I think it's just really important to have interaction with fans. And um, the fans are in different places. Twitter is my favorite but a lot of people are on Facebook, so I try to do that too. And um, where do you push them? Where do you ask them to um, you know, become super fans? Do they, you push them back to your website for an email list, or where do you send them to buy things? Well, I, I send them to my website, first of all, because it's the shortest thing to remember. It's just unwoman.com. And then on my website, you'll see uh, embedded Bandcamp little streamy widgets for all five of my albums so they can click play right away and start listening right away. Um, then there's, you know, little tidbits about my albums. I have an embedded Google Calendar for my shows. I have a thing to sign up for my email list. Um, and, uh, oh, there we go. So down there, right there, you have, that's my newest album. So that's the little Bandcamp widget. Um, here's a tiny bio. Here's some quotes from famous people so people will think I'm cool. And um, there's, you know, stuff up there. And uh, so, so a uh, question back there. Or but it's fine. I'll put it up here. Oh, okay. I have a question for you. Okay. Why do you like tweeting? What, what, why does it work for you? Um, just because it's very easy and short and brief and immediate and a lot of my friends are on Twitter too. What was your experience I guess like setting up your website? What was your strategy? Like how, how did you go about getting it? Did you do it yourself? Um, yeah, I made the website myself. Up until a few months ago it looked really 1994 uh -huh. even though I made it in 2000. And then I tried to make it prettier. It's really, really simple. And then I have a uh, like tons of web 2.0 ness on the main page. So if you scroll down, you would see I bet a Google Calendar and my tweets from the last five tweets or whatever. There's the calendar. Here's that's this the, at the very front. There's a YouTube video of a live performance. So it's just um, I don't know. It okay, what the header is? It looks like it's misspelled, but actually, if you're a little bit creative, it's actually an ambigram. So, so it looks like it says unwoman, but it's actually um, unwoman upside down. If you if you look at the N as an A, we'll see. It takes I don't know maybe maybe some people will always think it's misspelled, but it's on purpose. What did you use to? Is it a, is this WordPress? What are we looking at? Um, no, it's just HTML. All custom that you did. Yeah. Um. So, oh. uh, my question is, you're using Twitter. What age demographic are you in? That's hard to say. Uh, most of my friends are around 30, and, and a lot of my fans are a lot younger. Okay. Thank you. 
So since you're implementing all of this stuff, I'm just curious to know how is it going? Are you generating income because of all of this? Yeah, um, that's a very good question actually. Um, right before I quit my day job, I had a Kickstarter going to fund the pressing of my album. So, and I, I made that. Um, I made a little over $2,500 on Kickstarter. Um, I used some cheap pre-order options plus some really expensive I'll turn your poem into a song options and I you know, actually made most of my money through the expensive ones, but it was really good to have a variety of, of options for people. Um, so that, you know, funded the pressing of the actual CDs. And then um, uh, really luckily, a couple weeks after I quit my day job, Amanda Palmer noticed my Ustream. Um, so I was doing this live webcast show. She started watching it, tweeted about it a few times, and I got ridiculous amounts of sales that night. And um, some of my loyal fans who were on the chat knew to send everybody to Bandcamp. They were like, everybody go to unwoman.bandcamp.com and buy and pre-order her new album, which is coming out soon. So um, actually, I'm proud to say that in the last two months, I have been able to pay my rent through music. And if I lived anywhere besides San Francisco, I'd be able to live on it. So. What is the bullet? What is that? Uh, oh yeah. Table. So that's a really good question. Um, I sell some weird things on my Bandcamp as physical releases. Um, I had for a while, and I'm almost out now. I had some antique keys that were going with my release, the keys. Um, and this is a bullet-shaped, unwoman-branded USB drive that has my entire catalog on it. And um, I'm selling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so. You, the first thing you'll see, that's my new album, and if you go to this one, uh, down are the Casualties Instrumentals, which is like the bonus karaoke version of everything on the new album, this little thing here, the shiny red bullet USB, um, that has, you know, ridiculous amount of, of music on it. People can get my entire catalog for $40. So this is great for people who are just discovering me, who are really into me, um, which, you know, it happens, believe it or not. And um, and I even have, like, I, uh, Bandcamp is, is, uh, has offered uh, discount codes, and I have a discount code for people who've bought any of my other albums. They can email me to get a discount code so that they only have to pay $32 um, for the USB, so it's not so much like they're paying for the whole thing. So how much does it cost to have Bandcamp? Okay, good question. So Bandcamp uh, right now is free, and we actually don't take a cut from your sales, but the model that we will be uh, introducing in a couple months is that we um, will take a small cut. It'll be modest, uh, smaller than, um, obviously, than what you uh, pay to iTunes or Amazon or any of these stores today, because we want you to all, of course, be motivated to send all of your traffic uh, to your Bandcamp site, uh, as opposed to elsewhere. And um, the money, however, will continue to flow directly from the fan to you. Um, this question is actually for Ethan, and I am not an artist, but I work with many artists, so I have to log into Bandcamp and see all of the metrics, which is great. Um, what I've also noticed is that Bandcamp now reports to Nielsen's downscan, or that's what I, I saw it mentioned briefly on the Bandcamp blog, and I was wondering if you can expand upon that. Yeah, if you, um, if you include your UPC and ISRC codes, uh, we report your sales to, uh, to SoundScan uh, every Monday, I believe. Uh, so once a week, we uh, that reporting, and then those become uh, part of the, that's the data that's used to generate the billboard charts. What, whoever's nearest to mic, go oh, ahead. Captain Mike. <laughs> oh, uh, sorry. Uh, so are there any provisions or interested in the future to actually do DVD releases and to stream DVDs? Not just little clips, but like, you know, whole works. Right, we don't have any plans right now to host video, um, but I think, you know, in the near future we'll be allowing embedded video on the page and then uh, we'll continue to allow uh, video to be um, included in downloads, so selling, selling those downloads. Yes? So really this is, um, for on our own websites. We can have a dig digital aggregator so like she has, and but on our store site, on the store link on our website, this is where people would go. That's what you're... That's right. Yeah, okay. I, we're not proposing to um, replace uh, 
I, I don't think we're going to replace any of the these, you know, iTunes, Amazon, so on. But there's some fans that they're just going to be more comfortable going to iTunes to buy your stuff. So I personally recommend that everybody try to be in as many places as possible. But if you want to see the most money, if you want to have that interaction directly with your fans, um, this is uh, this is the place to be. At. And do you have a, a graphic designer that will help incorporate? No, no, no. Okay. No, this is it's entirely do it yourself. Eric, so Erica and I haven't we haven't met until uh, it, 30 minutes ago. Um, so the the it, it's entirely a self service system. So you upload cover art, you upload a header, you can change the background design. Um, we provide a, enough customization that you can make it your own, but we try to also have some limits in place so that it doesn't have end up having some of the problems you know that I think all of us are familiar with from last. It up. We have time for one more question. We have time for one more question. Okay. Um, this is just a sort of mechanical question. Do you guys, so you, you collect money, do you handle the tax reporting? You mentioned that. Or do we, we receive the money and have to fill out our own resale tax forms? Right. We don't touch the money at all right now. So the money goes from the fan directly to the artist via PayPal. And the money, uh, for example, if taxes are charged, so you're selling a physical release in state and okay. uh, taxes are collected. That, that money does go directly to you, but it's all broken down, very easy reporting. Report. Yeah. Thank you.